So anyway, my name is Bill Wesley. I've been interested in music since I was about four, <laughs> and in instrument design since about then. And uh, uh, when I came to San Diego in the early 70s, I began to think about how to build an electronic uh, device that would, that would increase and decrease a pitch or a timbre by octaves. And that led me to realize that basically the octaves on the piano should be right next to one another because they're the most related notes so that they should be closest, not furthest apart. And later on, I, I was very into kalimbas. I wanted to make a chromatic kalimba. When I began to think about that, I began to think about how to arrange the notes of the kalimba so that it could be chromatic. And that's when I thought of the octave rows and that they, you know, that you should just have all the times that relate by octaves next to one another. And then the next thought was, well, then what's the order of the times other than by octaves? And I thought, like most people would, chromatic order, C, C sharp, D, D sharp, E, blah, blah, blah. And then I drew that out and I thought, well, that's the same problem as the keyboard. You know, it's all these rows of octaves, even though they're together, you have to avoid in order to play any scale unless you're just playing a chromatic run. And then I thought, well, what happens if we order those octave rows in the circle of fifths? And that's what this is. These are each, you can see, octaves. And this is, you know, each one is a row. Now I've got it set up like a pyramid, kind of, so this is presumed to be your tonic. You know, your tonic is whatever you make it, but you know, the idea is you're playing that louder or more often or, or, or ending or beginning on it. And then these are all octaves of it going up and down. And then this is the, the you know, each one. Hey. <laughs> what? It's reversed. <laughs> the projector has reversed the order of it. Really? Well, it doesn't really matter, I guess. Yeah, and normally got fifths was, going left instead of right. Yeah, it's going left instead of right. It's not <laughs> a big deal. Um, uh, I, I made an Embira with this pattern, and it, you know, I wasn't sure it was going to work, and it worked fantastically. And then over the years, that was in 1984. And then over the years, I began to realize a lot of things about about this pattern. I was also studying microtonality, and actually, I had been into it long before I ever even heard the word, because Jimi Hendrix and Ravi Shankar seemed to be the thing to me, and their whole shtick was the microtonality, even though I wouldn't have called it that. And so, anyway, uh, I'm gonna switch to the one with, with ratios. I'm sorry this is going to be slow. I haven't had a chance to do a PowerPoint in advance. I kind of thought I'd have a bunch of charts to point to. Actually, there, uh, musical integral numbers? Yeah. No. Oh, you want, you want your color one, right? The array ratios, it's, uh, it's not color. Go down. Backup of array? I think it's further there. down. Oh, here you are, right here. There, right that one. Right no, not that one. Is there ratios? No, 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 but it's not all of them. I uh, need the black and white one of okay, all the ratios. It's the number. Pythagorean ratios. Pythagorean ratios. There we go. Okay. I wish I did have a PowerPoint to see. This is the array ratios. These are all octaves of one another. And this shows basically, basically everything is a power. All these expanded a little because I can barely read those numbers. All these are, are on top, on this side are powers of 2, you know, you can see 2, 4, 8, 16, and then these are all powers of 3, so there's not a ratio on here that isn't, that isn't composed of numbers that are a aren't a power of 2 or a power of 3, with the center one being the 0 power. And the thing is that any, any line of intervals is going to have the same difference in terms of powers, and it's going to be the same interval. So, for example, this is a uh, this is a, a whole tone. This is a fifth. This is a fourth. And then why is it tilted? Well, it's tilted because that way the height where these appear in height on the screen is how high they are in pitch. There's an exact correlation to pitch height to geometric height, and. John, I, I noticed, was talking about how 
basically you can invert the patterns of major and minor, and that's definitely true of this. You anything that you do on here, you know, if you were to play a scale, do re mi fa so la ti do, then if you do the reverse and go, you know, da 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 da, da right, it's minor. So, but there's another thing too, in that. If you have a form like this, that's a major chord. This, this, and this forms a triangle. Well, if I take that same triangle and go to this, this, and this, then it's the harmonic series of one, three, four. And basically, in the major chord, if I keep put that in, it just sort of enriches it, giving it a suspended plus major effect. So, so this would be that, and then that would be the fourth, third, second, and first harmonic. Then the same effect here for the minor chord. And then these would be the fourth, third, second, and first subharmonic. So you have four uh, orientations, but then there's also flipping the chord over. So in other words, this is a major chord. Well, here's the, the symmetrical inversion to the major chord. And then this would be an inversion to the harmonic series. This doesn't have a harmonic until way, way up. There's no harmonic that can approximate that. So this is the anti-harmonic series, the inversion of the major chord. Same deal here for the subharmonics. That's the anti-subharmonic series, and this is the inversion of the minor chord. So that means eight orientations in this field. And it means, and that is true, this is in Pythagorean, it doesn't matter what the tuning is. It could be any tuning at all. I could take these fifths, or these fourths, and I could change the fifths into minor thirds and the fourths into sevenths. This symmetry would hold as long as these, you know, the generating uh, 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 intervals were, were the same and it was a generalized field. So in any generalized field, there are these eight orientations which may be kind of why eight plays such a prominent role in rhythm. Because, you know, unconsciously, I, I heard, for example, Beethoven would play in the major scale all the time, but then he'd use this note here all the time, and the theorist was wondering why he always put this particular accidental in there. And when I looked at what he was doing, he was obeying the symmetry of this without, of course, having this to see as symmetry. And this is basically, if you really look at the way this works, that this note here, the most harmonious possible notes with this note are these notes here. Basa, and, and so if this, if this were the tonic, the same relationship would be with these four. If any of these notes on the infinite field, it extends infinitely, were, were, were the tonic, it'd be the same thing. So basically that mathematically proves that this fifth fourth array is the most resonant two-dimensional ordering of the notes possible. And given that, you would expect that this might have something to say uh, uh, about music. For one, it shows us why, you know, if, if, we, if we didn't know anything about music and we were devising it with reason and we just came up with this pattern and then after the fact went to see what its effect on music was, well, the first thing we notice is, is you end up with 12 notes. This here and this here and this here are a Pythagorean comma apart, so they're the 13th note. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And then this is the same as this. Now why do I, why do, I do this pattern and stop there? I don't have a graphic right now that shows it, but this shows it. This, is the, this here is our entire total range of nine octaves. And this is our temporal range of nine octaves because it turns out that if we go from the fastest tempo to the slowest tempo that we can perceive about one beat every 10 seconds, that it's nine octaves. And all the chords and all the procedures and all the scales and all the tunings and everything apply equally to tempos as they do to tones. And, and so microtemporeality is just as important as microtonality. Here, here. And when, when you, when you, 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 this here would be around 25 hertz or so, you know, somewhere in that middle and range between tone and tempo. And, and so why do I have this as the final thing? Well, because these, this, this note here and this note here are a Pythagorean comma apart. So they're roughly the same note. In 12 equal, they would be a perfect unison. 
And and but in 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 mean tone or Pythagorean and most things, they they constitute, you know, they're different by a comma. And there's an infinite series of commas going on. This here is the 72nd harmonic in Pythagorean, and this is the one, and the 72nd harmonic, and this is the 72nd subharmonic. So basically, it turns out that whatever is true this way, its opposite is true this way. So if this way is, is your major whole tones, most melodies all over the world, mainly whole tones, do, re, mi, well, the, that would mean the premier harmony would be this which is the octave row. So, so that's a 90 degree rotation. So we take the fifths. What I notice about the fifths is, is they sound like introductory intervals. They're beginning intervals. This is why it's sometimes irritating to hear parallel fifths because it's like starting and starting and starting and starting and not concluding. You know, which it's okay. Lots of movies do that. Lots of stories do that. But it can be a little bit irritating. These here are the fourths. What I notice is, is that in most cadences, they bring finality, conclusion, they stop. That's why also parallel fours can, are, were considered one, at one time dissonant. It's not really that they're dissonant, it's just that they keep concluding. The same is true of the rhythms. The rhythm for a fifth, if I take a beat of three to two, it's da 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 which wants to go on and on and on. But if I take the beat of the fourth, it's da 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 da. It wants to stop. So you take da 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 da. Nice, nice. It's the same cadence as it is tonally. Bill, could you wrap it up a little bit? We do have to go on. Yeah. We want to hear. Yeah, there's so much more. We're gonna hear it, right? Bill can go on for years. Next, we're gonna hear it. We're gonna listen to this next. Yes. Well, well, the thing, the thing about all this. Is, is that what I noticed is, is that, that, that the subjective effect of music conforms to this pattern. I can predict the subjective effects of music by this pattern. For example, if I confine myself with melody and harmony to this area here, which is diatonic and covers only three octaves, everything sounds light and safe and pretty. If I start including these out here, things start sounding dangerous and dark. And so this is an emotional parameter. Most emotions either are pleasurable or painful. And this is the pleasure pain parameter in that there are four other parameters of emotion. But further, see if you can find the, uh, the, 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 the periodic table. Oh, that's the particles. Well, that's okay. These are the, these are the, I was going to do the periodic table because more people know about that than, than the standard model. But the standard model has a very similar thing. Just like pleasure is light and pain is heavy, and literally that's the difference in the music, these are the low energy particles in here, and these out here are the high energy particles. These are the particles that are inside the nucleus, like the, the, the concluding force, and these are the particles that are outside the nucleus, you know? And, and so basically, there's a very similar symmetry, and that's not surprising, because if this pattern is the ultimate in terms of resonance, then you would expect that it has explanatory power in all forms of resonance, including the resonance, resonances of subatomic particles, of the elements, and so on and so forth. So on the one end, Basically, on the one end, this represents the encapsulation of subjectivity, of artistry, of, of the effects on feelings. It forms a geometry that tells you about feeling, but the same geometry also tells you about math and about objective things. So it unites basically the subjective and objective into one pattern. Wow. And, and, and allows a person that, that is, say, interested in only music to understand these other things in a, in a musical light. And someone who's only interested in physics to understand, you know, to come to understand music, which they never understood before, by allowing us to translate between these different realms through this geometry. Thank you, Bill. Thank you.